So here in lecture 12.3, we're going to really get to the computational heart of the logic side timing analysis, static timing analysis. We're going to show you how to take the gate level network and turn it into an appropriate graph, something called the delay graph that we can analyze. And we're going to look at a, a form of analysis that's a node-oriented form of analysis. All of the node elements in this graph are going to get labeled with some very important values. The arrival times, how long it takes to get from the launching clock edge, the required arrival times, uh, basically how long is it going to take to get to the capture clock edge, the concept of slack, which is hugely important, which you can think of as the amount of margin you have for either making a gate go a little bit slower and not hurting your overall timing, or if the slack is negative, uh-oh, I have a big problem here. These are the places I need to focus on immediately because these are my problems in my overall timing analysis. So let's go build the graph, look at all of the ways we annotate the graph with arrival times, required arrival times, and slacks, and look at how we can use this to go forward to do detailed timing analysis. So let's start talking about how we actually represent uh, a gate level logic network in a form where we can actually formulate the timing questions that we'd like to be able to answer. The basic representation for the static timing analysis is something called a delay graph. And you start with the gate network and you build the graph. So I've got a nice little network here, very simple. It's an AND gate feeding an OR gate. And the AND gate's got two inputs A and B, and they are primary inputs, so they the, the graph says PI is A, PI is B. They're primary inputs because they're inputs to the entire logic network. The output of the AND gate is C, it feeds the OR gate. The other input to the OR gate is D, and it's a primary input. It comes from the outside. The output of the OR gate is E. It's a primary output. It goes to the outside. So the first thing we have to say is, what do we know about the delays for this logic network? And the answer is that we know that the delays are from input pins to output pins. And so I'm just labeling them here. So there's an input to output delay A to C in the AND gate. The delay is delta is 2. Ditto, a delay from B to C, the delay is 2. And I'm just drawing that as a little arrow with a delta. Delta is 2. And the same, the delay from C to E and the delay from D to E in the OR gate is 3. So there's a little arrow that says delta equals 3. Now look, in a real logic network, these numbers aren't all the same. Right, they can be anything that's appropriate to model the physical reality of the gate. I'm only doing this because it makes things a little bit simple. Now, um, just a little bit of, of terminology for you. Those little edges that go from the gate input to the gate output have a name. They're often called cell arcs. Um, now, they're called arcs because arc is just another word for edge. And so they're, they're edges in a special kind of a graph. And they explain the timing. And we build these things for every cell in our technology library, which is a library of standard cells. So that's why they're called cell arcs, because we build them from input pins to output pins for the cells in our technology library. And they're, they're edges. They're edges in a special graph. Okay. Now, what's very interesting about the delay graph is that what we use for the nodes in the delay graph are the wires in the gate level network. So the gates don't make the nodes. Okay. Um, the gates actually make the edges. And if you sort of think about this for a second, this makes sense. What's interesting in, in the delay universe is that um, the delays are things that happen from input pins to output pins, from wires to wires. And so what we're going to do is represent the nodes of the graph as the wires, and the cell arcs, right, the delays, are the edges. So let's just sort of draw it. Um, I've got primary inputs A and B going into the AND gate, so I've got two nodes, A and B. I've got two wires going into the OR gate, C and D. C is the output of the AND gate. Um, D is a primary input, so I've got two nodes, C and D. And then I've got an output E from the OR gate, and so I've got a node E. Um, and now I can start drawing edges, because the edges are the delays. So I've got um, two cell arcs that go from A and B, respectively, to the output C. So I've got an edge with a 2 on it that goes from A to C, and an edge with a 2 on it that goes from B to C. And similarly, I've got two cell arcs on the inside of the OR gate that go from C to E and D to E, labeled 3. Okay, So this is the skeleton of the delay graph, but there's a little bit more that's, that's helpful in common. Okay, um, a pretty common convention is to add two special nodes. One of them is called the source, and one of them is called the sink. You add one source node that has a zero-weighted edge to every primary input. 
and you add one sync node with a zero weighted edge from every primary output. Or the other way to say this is, you look in the graph that I just built, every node that doesn't have an edge going into it, you connect that to the source. And you look at this graph, every node that doesn't have an edge going out of it, you connect that to the sink. So I'm just going to sort of uh, let these come in. So here's the source node that I'm being drawn on the left. It's got a zero edge to A, a zero edge to B, and a zero edge to D. And here's the sink node. It has a zero edge from E to the sink. Uh, why am I doing this? Um, this is not strictly necessary. But one nice thing about this for our purposes is that now the network has exactly one entry point. Okay, and that, that entry point is um, the source. And it has exactly one exit point, and that exit is the sink. And now all the longest path questions that my, I might ask from any primary input to any primary output, I can ask the same question about just saying, so what's the longest path from the source to the sink? And I'll figure out whatever the primary input is that's you know, causing me the problem. And I'll figure out whatever the primary output is that's causing me the problem. And I don't have to worry about it. Right? So I'm just going to be able to couch every question I ask in terms of, so what's going on from the source to the sink? So this is really common and I think just sort of conceptually helpful. Now, I still don't have any wire delays in here. What about the interconnect? What about you know, the physical wires that my router puts in? And it turns out there's actually you know, a pretty simple answer. You can still use a delay graph. We're just going to model each wire as a kind of a special gate um, that just has a delay. And so I'm again showing you a logic network. And the logic network has an AND gate and an OR gate. Um, and you know, nominally, the AND gate still has you know, inputs A and B and output C. And the OR gate has inputs C and D and output E. But now every single wire in this logic is replaced by, um, in, in this diagram, it looks sort of like a big tube. Um, which is just a, a, you know, an object that has a delay. So you know, there's a primary input A and a primary input B, and they each go through one of these delays to become inputs that I'm now calling X and Y that go into the AND gate, which still has a delay of 2. And the AND gate has an output C, which goes into a delay tube and becomes W, an input to the OR gate. And primary input D goes through one of these delay models and becomes Z, which goes into the OR gate, which makes E as its output, which goes into another delay. So you know, what's the delay on the wire from A to X? It's 1.2. What's the delay on the wire from B to Y? It's 1.6. What's the delay on the wire from C to W? 1.5. What's the delay on the wire from D to Z? 1. What's the delay on the wire from E to the final output, which we're now calling Q, the primary output, 1.8? Um, this thing can be just modeled by a delay graph, right? Every um, wire, you know, pin, um, is a node. And every delay, which in this case are everything where there's a delta, is an edge. Um, and so, you know, it's a little more complicated. So there's an A and a B input, and so there's an A and a B node. Um, those things go through delay models of wires to become X and Y inputs, so there's an X and Y node. Um, there are C and D. C is an output of the AND gate. D is an input, a primary input, so there's a C and a D node. W and Z are the new inputs to the OR gate. They're the outputs of delay models on wire, so there's a W and a Z node. There's an E output from the OR gate, um, which, goes, um, which is modeled, and there's a Q node now, which is the, the big primary output. And so then there's just all of the delays. Right, A goes to X with a 1.2 because there's a, there's a delay of a wire with 1.2. B goes to Y <clears throat> with a delay of 1.6 because there's a, a delay like that. Um, X and Y each go to C because the pin-to-pin -pin delays in the GAN gate are 2. C goes to W with a 1.5. D goes to Z with a 1.0. Those are wire delays. W and Z respectively go to E with a delay of 3 because those are gate delays, those are cell arcs. And E goes to Q with a 1.8 because there's a wire delay. And then similarly, you again put in the source and the sync node. The source node goes with zeros to A, B, and D. The sync node goes from Q to the output, and there we go. It's a bigger graph. It's got a lot more stuff in it, but it's still just a delay graph. And everything interesting that I can ask is, so what's going on with longest paths from the source to the sync? Now you can imagine that if you have millions and millions of logic gates, and you have millions and millions and millions of wires, and they've all got delays. And you've got all of those cell arcs because they've all got action happening with respect to delays from pin to pin. This is a pretty big graph.
And yes, it's a pretty big graph. So when we process this graph to answer questions on it, it better be something we can do really fast. And as we're going to see, <clears throat> you can actually do this really, really fast. It's a really nice thing. So um, I have now built the delay graph, and I can put wire delays in if I choose, and I can already model the gate delays. Um, how do I use this graph to do timing analysis? Um, well, all right, so look, <clears throat> here's what we don't do. We don't try to enumerate all the source to sync paths um, and then just you know, kind of pick the ones that look like they're problems. Um, there's no way to actually enumerate all the source to sync paths in any rational way. Uh, there's going to be an exponential explosion in the number of paths, even for a small graph. Here's a tiny little graph. It's got nodes 0, 1, 2, 3 to n written left to right in a row, and every single node has two arrows going to the right. So node 0 has two edges out going to node 1, node 1 has two edges out going to node 2, etc., to the end node, node n. How many paths are there from node 0 to node n? And the answer is, at every node, you can make a choice to take the arrow on the upside or the arrow on the downside. So there's, you know, there's basically two to the n paths here, um, you know, basically you know, from the beginning of this network to the end of this network. Um, you know, clearly, I need a smarter answer. Um, and the smarter answer is something called node-oriented timing analysis. Um, and what's interesting about node-oriented timing analysis is that we're going to find for each node in the delay graph the worst node along any path. And we're going to label the node with some interesting information in a very efficient way. You know, a couple of walks through a, through a, through a graph. Um, and once we know that information on the node, each node in the delay graph, we're going to be able to do all the analysis that we need. It's actually very nice and very convenient. So we need to define some stuff. And here's what we need. We need to define some special values on the nodes in the delay graph. So I've got a little picture here. I've got the source node at the left and the sync node at the right. And I've got a kind of a squiggly line that says other paths. And I've got a highlighted node that says n on it. And I've got a squiggly path from the source and a squiggly path to the sync. There's all kinds of stuff in front of n and all kinds of stuff after n. But n is the node I want to talk about. And so here are the things that we're going to have to define. We're going to define something important called the arrival time at node n. And that's actually written as capital AT. And it's actually called an at. Right? So we talk about ats at a node. And AT of n, at of n, is the latest time the signal can become stable at node n. So you know the signal leaves the flip-flop Q, goes through a bunch of logic, wiggles around for a while, and becomes a stable value. How long does that take? So the way to think about that is that's sort of like a longest path from the source. And it's sometimes called the delay to the node or the delay to node n. Now, um, on the other side, there's something called the required arrival time, or the RAT, which is actually called a rat. Um, and so they're called rats. And so rat n, the required arrival time, is the latest time the signal is allowed to become stable at node n. So you can kind of think of that as it's kind of like the longest path to the sink. Um, sort of, and I'm going to emphasize the sort of because as we're going to see very shortly, um, ats are referenced from the start of the clock period, rats are referenced from the end of the clock period, um, which means that they, they have a special form when you, when you get computed as a number. But thinking of them as the longest path to the sink is still sort of the mentally right model. They're sort of like the delay from the node to the other edge of the clock. And then we have a new concept, um, a very, very important concept, the slack at node n. And the slack is the rat minus the at. So if you can compute the arrival time at a node and then compute the required arrival time at the node, you take the rat, you subtract the at, and you get the slack. And this is an amazingly important concept in timing analysis. The slack is the amount of timing margin for a signal. Positive is good and negative is bad. It's determined by the longest path through the node. So I've got the same picture at the bottom, a source node at the left, a sync node at the right, a squiggly line that says other paths, and I've got a, an arrow that says ats going to node n, and an arrow that says rats going from node n to the sync. And it's sort of from the source through the ats to the end, through the rats to the sync, that's sort of where all the action is. You compute the at for every node, you compute the rat for every node, rat minus at is slack, everything that's interesting is in a slack. Um, you know, what can we say about the slack? The slack is the amount by which a signal can be delayed at a node and not increase the longest path through the network. So it's kind of timing margin. You can increase the delay at a node that has positive slack and do something useful, like maybe minimize the power or minimize the circuit area. 
um, and not degrade the overall performance. So it tells you where you have extra margin that you can use to, you know, sort of maybe optimize the circuit. And similarly, negative slacks are bad. Those are the places where you've got real problems. So slack is the rat minus the at. That's the big thing to remember. More interesting information about slack. Slack is hugely important in timing analysis. Slacks are always defined so negative slacks are bad. It indicates a timing problem, and it measures the sensitivity of the network to this node's delay. So if you have positive slack, that's always a good thing. I can change something about this node and not hurt the network's overall timing. So maybe I can make this node slower. Maybe I can save some power and not hurt the timing. Negative slacks are always bad. You have negative slack at a node, you have a problem at a node. And the more negative the slack, the bigger the problem you have at the node. So you're looking for a node to help fix some timing because you've got some timing problems? Go look at the nodes where you have negative slack. Want to know the biggest problems you've got? Go look at the nodes with the most negative slack. Those are the places that affect the critical paths the most. So it's a very useful concept. How do you compute these things? Well, um, you should, you know, it should not be any surprise. You compute these things recursively. So I've got a diagram here. Um, and so again, I've got the source node at the left and the sync node at the right. And the source node fans out to a whole bunch of highlighted nodes that are immediately in front of um, a node called N that's, that's, that's highlighted. And every single one of those nodes in front of node N has an arrow. Um, and um, that's basically between the source and node N. And then between node N and the sync, there's also a lot of nodes, um, but they're all grayed out. Okay, so just some, you know, some terminology here. Um, the nodes that are immediately in front of N that are one edge away from N are the predecessors of N. And so we call that pred of N, P-R-E-D of N. And I've got one of them highlighted here. It's got a node that's got a P on it. And note that every one of those nodes that are the predecessors of N has a delay value. That's what the delta is. So there's a delta P of N, which is the delay from node P to node N in my delay graph. And what's the formula for AT of N? What's the formula for the AT? What is the formula for the arrival time? The arrival time is the maximum delay to node N. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's as simple as you would guess it is. What's the maximum delay? Well, if this node is the source, it's zero. You know, what's the, you know, the maximum path from the source uh, to the source? Zero. Otherwise, you compute it recursively. You look at all of your predecessors. It's the maximum over all of the predecessors of the arrival time to the predecessor plus the delay from the predecessor to me, to node n. So it's the max over all the predecessors, p, of the at of node p plus the delta, the delay from node p to node n. So simple as that. Very simple recursive definition. Are you the source? Hey, your longest path is zero by definition. Are you not the source? Look at the longest path to the nodes one in front of you. Take that number. Add the delay from that node to you. Take the biggest one. That's what your arrival time is. So here's a, um, just a, a quick concrete example of how to do arrival time. So I've got a source node drawn here and a bunch of fan outs. And then I've got three distinguished nodes labeled P and Q and R that are all feeding another distinguished node N. And uh, I'm looking to calculate the arrival time for N. So what do I need to know? <clears throat> well, you know, um, uh, at the very least, I need to know the information about the arrival times of my predecessors. My predecessors for node N are P, Q, and R. So what do I need? I need to know that the arrival time of P is 5 and the delay from P to N is 7. I need to know that the arrival time of Q is 10 and the delay from Q to N is 1. And I need to know that the arrival time at R is 5 and the delay from R to N is 5. And then I can actually use the formula for what the arrival time at N is. The arrival time at N is the maximum over the predecessors. And I'm saying that this is the maximum over X element of set PQR. So X is a predecessor. The predecessors are PQR. And what is it a maximum over? Uh, AT of X, the AT of X, the predecessor plus the delay delta from X to N. And so this is the maximum over 5 plus 7. That's the P node. 10 plus 1, the Q node. And 5 plus 5, the R node. So that's the maximum over 12, 11, or 10, and so that's a 12, right? So you know, the worst thing that can happen, the worst arrival at N is a 12, and it happens to occur because of the delay to node P, the predecessor, with a, an arrival time of 5, and the delay from P to N of 7. So, you know, if you know the longest path to the predecessor, 
It's a simple maximum operation to compute the longest path to n. And yeah, it's just the Dijkstra thing again. It really is. So pretty simple to calculate the ats. So how do you compute the rats? Well, you compute the rats also recursively, but you basically you're going to compute the rats by going from the sink kind of backwards um, toward the source. So again, I've got a diagram. The sink is on the left. The, uh, the source is on the left. The sink is on the right. There are paths uh, exiting and fanning out from the source to a bunch of nodes, um, the predecessors of node n that have delay arrows into n. n has an edge going out to a set of highlighted nodes. One of them is distinguished. It has an s, one edge away from node n. And the node s has an edge um, that's labeled delta n s. And so again, we have a little bit of terminology. Um, the successors of node n are um, SUCK, S-U-C-C of N, successors of N. So those are the nodes that are one edge away, outgoing from node N. All right, now, I need a little more stuff to be able to calculate the rats. Um, I need the cycle time on the clock. You have to tell me how long the clock is. All right, and the reason is that the rats are defined relative to the clock cycle. And this isn't a problem with the ATs, the arrival time, because we just assume that the clock starts at zero. Okay? Um, but I actually need to know what the cycle time is on the clock um, because the, uh, the rats are defined relative to the end of the clock cycle. So here's what we get. Um, the rats are the latest time in the clock cycle where the signal at node n could change and the signal would still propagate to the sink before the end of the cycle. All right. So how we calculate that is as follows. Well, if you are the sync node, then the required arrival time is the cycle time. Like, when do you have to actually get, if you're a logic signal, to the sync node? And the answer is in the cycle time. Right? That makes sense. Um, otherwise, everything is sort of backwards from the at. So instead of a maximum, it's the minimum. We calculate the minimum over the successors S element of the successors of n of the required arrival time of the nodes that are one edge closer to the sink and then we subtract the delay the delta from n to s why is this a minimum the answer is because we're trying to figure out basically the longest path to the sink and so we're interested if we're rel if all of this stuff is relative to the edge of the final edge of the clock and we're trying to get a number in the clock cycle we're looking for the smallest time number right because that's going to be the one that's the farthest away from the clock edge that's the longest edge from that's the longest path to the t so what's the rat it's the cycle time if you're the sink otherwise it's the min of over your successors of the rat minus the edge delay So um, I've now got the at and the rat drawn right next to each other to just talk a little bit about, you know, like, why are there these differences, right? So the formula on the left says that the at is zero if the node is the source. Otherwise, it's the max over the predecessors of the at plus the delay. And the rat formula says the rat is the cycle time if n is the sink, or it's the minimum of the rat minus the delay. So, you know, what's, what's going on here? So look. Let's just be clear that here's the picture of the clock, and I've got sort of two up arrows, and then you know, kind of up, down, up, you know, going in between. The leftmost edge of the clock is launching the data out of the flip-flops, and then we go through the logic, hopefully in you know less time than the clock cycle takes, right? And we arrive at another set of flip-flops, and we are capturing things. So there's the launch edge and the capture edge. The arrival time is basically the longest logic delay after the launch edge. And so it's easy to see that it's you know, the maximum of recursive arrival times plus delays. The required arrival time is basically cal calculated backwards from the cycle time. It's calculated backwards from the capture edge of the clock. So you know, if you are the sync node, you, you know, the, the required arrival time is the cycle time. And when you're calculating it backwards, you take the required arrival time of things closer to the sync node, and you subtract the delays. And, and because you're looking for the longest thing to the capture edge, but you're looking for a number like relative to the launch edge, you want the minimum because you want the thing that's closest to the start that's farthest from the capture edge. Right? So that's why it works that way. You know, the ats are defined relative to zero, the launch edge. The rats are defined relative to um, the capture edge, which is the cycle time. The ats are taking maximums and adding things because we're heading you know, toward, toward the 
capture edge. The rats are minimums and subtractions because we're sort of subtracting everything from whatever the number is, you know, one nanosecond. So that's why there's that, you know, slightly strange looking asymmetry. Bad things happen when we see this. That's the, the big thing to emphasize here. Bad things happen when we see this. When the slack, which is defined as the rat minus the ad, is negative, bad things happen. So I've got another picture of a clock. Launch edge goes up, clock goes up, down, up, and got a capture edge, and I've got the clock cycle. Right? So here is the arrival time. Right? It starts at the launch edge, and it's a little arrow that goes over, and it's some time in the middle of the clock cycle. That's the arrival time. You know, it's a number. And let's remember that the required arrival time is another number. Right? The big thing, and I'm just going to put a little star here, the big thing is that the required arrival time is not the length of a path. The required arrival time is a number in the clock cycle. Right? The arrival time is both a number in the clock cycle and the length of the path because we're all starting at zero. The required arrival time is a number. Right? So many picoseconds after zero. Right? Because it's calculated backwards from the capture edge. If the rat is bigger than the at, right, then you have negative slack. And what are you saying? You're saying the signal arrives too late and there's too much delay from where it arrived at to the capture edge of the clock, so the signal does not arrive at the flip-flop input before the capture edge of the clock. Right? You say, look, it takes this long to get to the node, that's the at, it takes this much longer to get to the capture edge, that's the rat, and I'm sorry, but you know, those two things are just, you know, there's just not enough time in the clock cycle, the signal's not going to arrive at the capture edge and you're going to lose that logic, you're going to lose that value, it's not going to get captured, your timing doesn't work, your logic doesn't work, you have to go fix something. So, that's why the rats are defined the way they are, that's why the ats are defined the way they are, that's why rats minus ats is what's interesting, that's why negative slack is a terrible, terrible thing. You never wish it to happen to a friend. Okay? And why what we're going to do next is show you how you can calculate ats and rats and slacks very, very quickly, even when you have a gigantic delay graph. So, let's go see how we do that.